Section 7 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France, and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event, in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Section 7. The kind of anniversary sermons, to which a great part of what I write, refers, if men are not shamed out of their present course, in commemorating the fact, will cheat many out of the principles, and deprive them of the benefits of the revolution they commemorate. I confess to you, sir, I never liked this continual talk of resistance and revolution, or the practice of making the extreme medicine of the Constitution its daily bread it renders the habit of society dangerously valetudinary it is taking periodical doses of mercury sublimate and swallowing down repeated provocatives of cantharides to our love of liberty this distemper of remedy grown habitual relaxes and wears out by a vulgar and prostituted use the spring of that spirit which is to be exerted on great occasions it was in the most patient period of roman servitude that themes of tyrannicide made the ordinary exercise of boys at school cum perimit sevos classis numerosa tyrannos in the ordinary state of things it produces in a country like ours the worst effects even on the cause of that liberty which it abuses with the dissoluteness of an extravagant speculation almost all the high-bred republicans of my time have after a short space become the most decided thorough-paced courtiers they soon left the business of a tedious moderate but practical resistance to those of us whom in the pride and intoxication of their theories they have slighted as not much better than tories hypocrisy of course delights in the most sublime speculations for never intending to go beyond speculation it costs nothing to have it magnificent but even in cases where rather levity than fraud was to be suspected in these ranting speculations the issue has been much the same these professors finding their extreme principles not applicable to cases which call only for a qualified or as i may say civil and legal resistance in such cases employ no resistance at all it is with them a war or a revolution or it is nothing finding their schemes of politics not adapted to the state of the world in which they live they often come to think lightly of all public principle and are ready on their part to abandon for a very trivial interest what they find of very trivial value some indeed are of more steady and persevering natures but these are eager politicians out of parliament who have little to tempt them to abandon their favorite projects they have some change in the church or state or both constantly in their view when that is the case they are always bad citizens and perfectly unsure connections for considering their speculative designs as of infinite value and the actual arrangement of the state as of no estimation they are at best indifferent about it they see no merit in the good and no fault in the vicious management of public affairs they rather rejoice in the latter as more propitious to revolution they see no merit or demerit in any man or any action or any political principle any further than as they may forward or retard their design of change they therefore take up one day the most violent and stretched prerogative and another time the wildest democratic ideas of freedom and pass from the one to the other without any sort of regard to cause to person or to party in france you are now in the crisis of a revolution and in the transit from one form of government to another you cannot see that character of men exactly in the same situation in which we see it in this country with us it is militant with you it is triumphant and you know how it can act when its power is commensurate to its will I would not be supposed to confine those observations to any description of men, or to comprehend all men of any description within them. No, far from it. I am as incapable of that injustice as I am of keeping terms with those who profess principles of extremes, and who, under the name of religion, 
teach little else than wild and dangerous politics. The worst of these politics of revolution is this. They temper and harden the breast, in order to prepare it for the desperate strokes which are sometimes used in extreme occasions. But as these occasions may never arrive, the mind receives a gratuitous taint, and the moral sentiments suffer not a little, when no political purpose is served by the deprivation. This sort of people are so taken up with their theories about the rights of man that they have totally forgot his nature. Without opening one new avenue to the understanding, they have succeeded in stopping up those that lead to the heart. They have perverted in themselves, and in those that attend to them, all the well-placed sympathies of the human breast. This famous sermon of the old Jewry breathes nothing but this spirit through all the political part. Plots, massacres, assassinations, seem to some people a trivial price for obtaining a revolution. A cheap bloodless reformation, a guiltless liberty, appear flat and vapid to their taste. There must be a great change of scene, there must be a magnificent stage effect, there must be a grand spectacle to rouse the imagination, grown torpid with the lazy enjoyment of sixty years' security, and the still unanimating repose of public prosperity. The preacher found them all in the French Revolution. This inspires a juvenile warmth through his whole frame. His enthusiasm kindles as he advances, and when he arrives at his peroration, it is in a full blaze. Then viewing from the Pisgah of his pulpit the free, moral, happy, flourishing, and glorious state of France, as in a bird-eye landscape of a promised land, he breaks out into the following rapture. What an eventful period this is! I am thankful that I have lived to it. I could almost say, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I have lived to see a diffusion of knowledge which has undermined superstition and error. I have lived to see the rights of men better understood than ever, and nations panting for liberty, which seem to have lost the idea of it. I have lived to see thirty millions of people, indignant and resolute, spurning at slavery, and demanding liberty with an irresistible voice, their king led in triumph, and an arbitrary monarch surrendering himself to his subjects. Footnote. Another of these reverend gentlemen, who was witness to some of the spectacles which Paris has lately exhibited, expresses himself thus. A king dragged in submissive triumph by his conquering subjects, is one of those appearances of grandeur which seldom rise in the prospect of human affairs, and which, during the remainder of my life, I shall think of with wonder and gratification. These gentlemen agree marvelously in their feelings. End of footnote. Before I proceed further, I have to remark that Dr. Price seems rather to overvalue the great acquisitions of light which he has obtained and diffused in this age. The last century appears to me to have been quite as much enlightened. It had, though in a different place, a triumph as memorable as that of Dr. Price, and some of the great preachers of that period partook of it as eagerly as he has done in the triumph of France. On the trial of the Reverend Hugh Peters for high treason, it was deposed that when King Charles was brought to London for his trial, the Apostle of Liberty in that day conducted the triumph. I saw, says the witness, his majesty in the coach with six horses, and Peters riding before the king triumphing. Dr. Price, when he talks as if he had made a discovery, only follows a precedent. For after the commencement of the king's trial, this precursor, the same Dr. Peters, concluding a long prayer at the royal chapel at Whitehall, he had very triumphantly chosen his place, said, I have prayed and preached these twenty years, and now I may say with old Simeon, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Peters had not the fruits of his prayer, for he neither departed so soon as he wished, nor in peace. He became what I heartily hope none of his followers may be in this country, himself a sacrifice to the triumph which he led as pontiff. They dealt at the restoration, perhaps, too hardly with this poor good man, but we owe it to his memory and his sufferings 
that he had as much illumination and as much zeal and had as effectually undermined all the superstition and error which might impede the great business he was engaged in as any who follow and repeat after him in this age which would assume to itself an exclusive title to the knowledge of the rights of men and all the glorious consequences of that knowledge after this sally of the preacher of the old jewry which differs only in place and time but agrees perfectly with the spirit and letter of the rapture of sixteen forty eight the revolution society the fabricators of governments the heroic band of cashiers of monarchs electors of sovereigns and leaders of kings in triumph strutting with a proud consciousness of the diffusion of knowledge of which every member had obtained so large a share in the donative were in haste to make a generous diffusion of the knowledge they had thus gratuitously received to make this bountiful communication they adjourned from the church in the old jewry to the london tavern where the same dr price in whom the fumes of his oracular tripod were not entirely evaporated moved and carried the resolution or address of congratulation transmitted by lord stanhope to the national assembly of france i find a preacher of the gospel profaning the beautiful and prophetic ejaculation commonly called nunc dimittis made on the first presentation of our saviour in the temple and applying it with an inhuman and unnatural rapture to the most horrid atrocious and afflicting spectacle that perhaps ever was exhibited to the pity and indignation of mankind this leading in triumph a thing in its best form unmanly and irreligious which fills our preacher with such unhallowed transports must shock i believe the moral taste of every well-born mind several english were the stupefied and indignant spectators of that triumph it was unless we have been strangely deceived a spectacle more resembling a procession of american savages entering into onondaga after some of their murders called victories and leading into hovels hung round with scalps their captives overpowered with the scoffs and buffets of women as ferocious as themselves much more than it resembled the triumphal pomp of a civilized martial nation if a civilized nation or any men who had a sense of generosity were capable of a personal triumph over the fallen and afflicted this my dear sir was not the triumph of france i must believe that as a nation it overwhelmed you with shame and horror i must believe that the national assembly find themselves in a state of the greatest humiliation in not being able to punish the authors of this triumph or the actors in it and that they are in a situation in which any inquiry they may make upon the subject must be destitute even of the appearance of liberty or impartiality the apology of that assembly is found in their situation but when we approve what they must bear it is in us the degenerate choice of a vitiated mind with a compelled appearance of deliberation they vote under the dominion of a stern necessity they sit in the heart as it were of a foreign republic they have their residence in a city whose constitution has emanated neither from the charter of their king nor from their legislative power there they are surrounded by an army not raised either by the authority of their crown or by their command and which if they should order to dissolve itself would instantly dissolve them there they sit after a gang of assassins had driven away some hundreds of the members whilst those who held the same moderate principles with more patience or better hope continued every day exposed to outrageous insults and murderous threats there a majority sometimes real sometimes pretended captive itself compels a captive king to issue as royal edicts at third hand the polluted nonsense of their most licentious and giddy coffee-houses it is notorious that all their measures are decided before they are debated it is beyond doubt that under the terror of the bayonet and the lamp-post and the torch to their houses they are obliged to adopt all the crude and desperate measures suggested by clubs composed of a monstrous medley of all conditions tongues and nations among these are found persons in comparison of whom catiline would be thought scrupulous and cethegus a man of sobriety and moderation 
nor is it in these clubs alone that the public measures are deformed into monsters they undergo a previous distortion in academies intended as so many seminaries for these clubs which are set up in all the places of public resort in these meetings of all sorts every council in proportion as it is daring and violent and perfidious is taken for the mark of superior genius humanity and compassion are ridiculed as the fruits of superstition and ignorance tenderness to individuals is considered as treason to the public liberty is always to be estimated perfect as property is rendered insecure amidst assassination massacre and confiscation perpetrated or mediated they are forming plans for the good order of future society embracing in their arms the carcasses of base criminals and promoting their relations on the title of their offences they drive hundreds of virtuous persons to the same end by forcing them to subsist by beggary or by crime the assembly their organ acts before them the farce of deliberation with as little decency as liberty they act like the comedians of a fair before a riotous audience they act amidst the tumultuous cries of a mixed mob of ferocious men and of women lost to shame who according to their insolent fancies direct control applaud explode them and sometimes mix and take their seats amongst them domineering over them with a strange mixture of servile petulance and proud presumptuous authority as they have inverted order in all things the gallery is in the place of the house this assembly which overthrows kings and kingdoms has not even the physiognomy and aspect of a grave legislative body ne color imperii ne frons erat ulla senatus they have a power given to them like that of the evil principle to subvert and destroy but none to construct except such machines as may be fitted for further subversion and further destruction who is it that admires and from the heart is attached to national representative assemblies but must turn with horror and disgust from such a profane burlesque and abominable perversion of that sacred institute lovers of monarchy lovers of republics must alike abhor it the members of your assembly must themselves groan under the tyranny of which they have all the shame none of the direction and little of the profit i am sure many of the members who compose even the majority of that body must feel as i do notwithstanding the applauses of the revolution society miserable king miserable assembly how must that assembly be silently scandalized with those of their members who could call a day which seemed to blot the sun out of heaven um bonjour footnote october sixth seventeen eighty nine end of footnote how must they be inwardly indignant at hearing others who thought fit to declare to them that the vessel of the state would fly forward in her course towards regeneration with more speed than ever from the stiff gale of treason and murder which preceded our preacher's triumph what must they have felt whilst with outward patience and inward indignation they heard of the slaughter of innocent gentlemen in their houses that the blood spilled was not the most pure what must they have felt when they were besieged by the complaints of disorders which shook their country to its foundations at being compelled coolly to tell the complainants that they were under the protection of the law and that they would address the king the captive king to cause the laws to be enforced for their protection when the enslaved ministers of that captive king had formally notified to them that there were neither law nor authority nor power left to protect what must they have felt at being obliged as a felicitation on the present new year to request their captive king to forget the stormy period of the last on account of the great good which he was likely to produce to his people to the complete attainment of which good they adjourned the practical demonstrations of their loyalty assuring him of their obedience when he should no longer possess any authority to command this address was made with much good nature and affection to be sure but among the revolutions in france must be reckoned a considerable revolution in their ideas of politeness in england we are said to learn manners at second hand from your side of the water and that we dress our behavior in the frippery of france 
if so we are still in the old cut and have not so far conformed to the new parisian mode of good breeding as to think it quite in the most refined strain of delicate compliment whether in condolence or congratulation to say to the most humiliated creature that crawls upon the earth that great public benefits are derived from the murder of his servants the attempted assassination of himself and of his wife and the mortification disgrace and degradation that he has personally suffered it is a topic of consolation which our ordinary of newgate would be too humane to use to a criminal at the foot of the gallows i should have thought that the hangman of paris now that he is liberalized by the vote of the national assembly and has allowed his rank and arms in the herald's college of the rights of men would be too generous too gallant a man too full of the sense of his new dignity to employ that cutting consolation to any of the persons whom the lese nation might bring under the administration of his executive powers a man is fallen indeed when he is thus flattered the anodyne draught of oblivion thus drugged is well calculated to preserve a galling wakefulness and to feed the living ulcer of a corroding memory thus to administer the opiate portion of amnesty powdered with all the ingredients of scorn and contempt is to hold to his lips instead of the balm of hurt minds the cup of human misery full to the brim and to force him to drink it to the dregs yielding to reasons at least as forcible as those which were so delicately urged in the compliment on the new year the king of france will probably endeavor to forget these events and that compliment but history who keeps a durable record of all our acts and exercises her awful censure over the proceedings of all sorts of sovereigns will not forget either those events or the era of this liberal refinement in the intercourse of mankind history will record that on the morning of the sixth of october seventeen eighty nine the king and queen of france after a day of confusion alarm dismay and slaughter lay down under the pledged security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled melancholy repose from this sleep the queen was first startled by the voice of the sentinel at her door who cried out to her to save herself by flight that this was the last proof of fidelity he could give that they were upon him and he was dead instantly he was cut down a band of cruel ruffians and assassins reeking with his blood rushed into the chamber of the queen and pierced with a hundred strokes of bayonets and poniards in the bed from whence this persecuted woman had but just time to fly almost naked and through ways unknown to the murderers had escaped to seek refuge at the feet of a king and husband not secure of his own life for a moment this king to say no more of him and this queen and their infant children who once would have been the pride and hope of a great and generous people were then forced to abandon the sanctuary of the most splendid palace in the world which they left swimming in blood polluted by massacre and strewed with scattered limbs and mutilated carcasses thence they were conducted into the capital of their kingdom two had been selected from the unprovoked unresisted promiscuous slaughter which was made of the gentlemen of birth and family who composed the king's bodyguard these two gentlemen with all the parade of an execution of justice were cruelly and publicly dragged to the block and beheaded in the great court of the palace their heads were stuck upon spears and led the procession whilst the royal captives who followed in the train were slowly moved along amidst the horrid yells and shrilling screams and frantic dances and infamous contumelies and all the unutterable abominations of the furies of hell in the abused shape of the vilest of women after they had been made to taste drop by drop more than the bitterness of death in the slow torture of a journey of twelve miles protracted to six hours they were under a guard composed of those very soldiers who had thus conducted them through this famous triumph lodged in one of the old palaces of paris now converted into a bastille for kings is this a triumph to be consecrated at altars to be commemorated with grateful thanksgiving to be offered to the divine humanity with fervent prayer and enthusiastic ejaculation these theban and thracian orgies acted in france 
and applauded only in the old jewry i assure you kindle prophetic enthusiasm in the minds but of very few people in this kingdom although a saint and apostle who may have revelations of his own and who has so completely vanquished all the mean superstitions of the heart may incline to think it pious and decorous to compare it with the entrance into the world of the prince of peace proclaimed in a holy temple by a venerable sage and not long before not worse announced by the voice of angels to the quiet innocence of shepherds at first i was at a loss to account for this fit of unguarded transport i knew indeed that the sufferings of monarchs make a delicious repast to some sort of palates there were reflections which might serve to keep this appetite within some bounds of temperance but when i took one circumstance into my consideration i was obliged to confess that much allowance ought to be made for the society and that the temptation was too strong for common discretion i mean the circumstance of the eopean of the triumph the animating cry which called for all the bishops to be hanged on the lamp-posts footnote tous les évêques à la lanterne end of footnote might well have brought forth a burst of enthusiasm on the foreseen consequences of this happy day i allow to so much enthusiasm some little deviation from prudence i allow this prophet to break forth into hymns of joy and thanksgiving on an event which appears like the precursor of the millennium and the projected fifth monarchy in the destruction of all church establishments there was however as in all human affairs there is in the midst of this joy something to exercise the patience of these worthy gentlemen and to try the long-suffering of their faith the actual murder of the king and queen and their child was wanting to the other auspicious circumstances of this beautiful day the actual murder of the bishops though called for by so many holy ejaculations was also wanting a group of regicide and sacrilegious slaughter was indeed boldly sketched but it was only sketched it unhappily was left unfinished in this great history piece of the massacre of innocence what hardy pencil of a great master from the school of the rights of men will finish it is to be seen hereafter the age has not yet the complete benefit of that diffusion of knowledge that has undermined superstition and error and the king of france wants another object or two to consign to oblivion in consideration of all the good which is to arise from his own sufferings and the patriotic crimes of an enlightened age footnote it is proper here to refer to a letter written upon this subject by an eye-witness that eye-witness was one of the most honest intelligent and eloquent members of the national assembly one of the most active and zealous reformers of the state he was obliged to secede from the assembly and he afterwards became a voluntary exile on account of the horrors of this pious triumph and the dispositions of men who profiting of crimes if not causing them have taken the lead in public affairs extract of monsieur de lally tolendal's second letter to a friend parlons du parti que j'ai pris il est bien justifié dans ma conscience ni cette ville coupable ni cette assemblée plus coupable encore ne méritait que je me justifie mais j'ai à cœur que vous et les personnes qui pensent comme vous ne me condamnent pas ma santé je vous jure me rendait mes fonctions impossibles mais même en les mettant de côté, il a été au-dessus de mes forces de supporter plus longtemps l'horreur que me causait ce sang, ces têtes, cette reine presque égorgée, ce roi amené esclave, entrant à Paris au milieu de ses assassins et précédé des têtes de ses malheureux gardes, ces perfides janissaires, ces assassins, ces femmes cannibales, ce cri de « tous les évêques à la lanterne » dans le moment où le roi entre sa capitale avec deux évêques de son conseil dans sa voiture, un coup de fusil que j'ai vu tirer dans un des carrosses de la reine, M. Bailly appelant cela un beau jour, l'Assemblée ayant déclaré froidement le matin qu'il n'était pas de sa dignité d'aller tout entière environner le roi, M. Mirabeau disant impunément dans cette Assemblée que le vaisseau de l'État, loin d'être arrêté dans sa course, s'élancerait avec plus de rapidité que jamais vers sa régénération, M. Barnave riant avec lui quand des flots de sang coulaient autour de nous, le vertueux Mounier, échappant par miracle à vingt assassins qui avaient voulu faire de sa tête un trophée de plus 
Subnote. N.B.M. Monnier was then Speaker of the National Assembly. He has since been obliged to live in exile, though one of the firmest asserters of liberty. End of subnote. Voilà ce qui me fit jurer de ne plus mettre le pied dans cette caverne d'anthropophage. The National Assembly. Où je n'avais plus de force d'élever la voix, où, depuis six semaines, je l'avais élevée en vain. Moi, Mounier et tous les honnêtes gens, on pensait que le dernier effort à faire pour le bien était d'en sortir. Aucune idée de crainte ne s'est approchée de moi. Je rougirais de m'en défendre. J'avais encore reçu sur la route de la part de ce peuple, moins coupable que ceux qui l'ont enivré de fureur, des acclamations et des applaudissements dont d'autres auraient été flattés et qui m'ont fait frémir. C'est à l'indignation, c'est à l'horreur, c'est aux convulsions physiques que le seul aspect du sang me fait éprouver que j'ai cédé. On brave une seule mort. On la brave plusieurs fois quand elle peut être utile. Mais aucune puissance sous le ciel, mais aucune opinion publique ou privée n'ont le droit de me condamner à souffrir inutilement mille supplices par minute et à périr de désespoir, de rage, au milieu des triomphes du crime que je n'ai pu arrêter. Ils me proscriront, ils confisqueront mes biens. Je labourerai la terre et je ne les verrai plus. Voilà ma justification. Vous pourrez la lire, la montrer, la laisser copier. Tant pis pour ceux qui ne la comprendront pas. Ce ne sera alors moi qui aurai eu tort de la leur donner. End of extract. This military man had not so good nerves as the peaceable gentleman of the old Jewry. See M. Monnier's narrative of these transactions, a man also of honor and virtue and talents, and therefore a fugitive. End of footnote and end of section seven.